Can you hear me? Good, that's much better. Good morning. Thanks for this lovely bracelet. Fab, thank you. Thank you. I hear there are no protocols at switch point, eh? So I'll just say good morning, switch pointers. Pap told me not to wear a suit. Then he wore his best suit today. You can't trust the guy. Yeah? <laughs> but Pap, first, I want, to, I want to appreciate you and uh, congratulate you for the nomination and for the award. Pap just got a great award as the winner of the Global Health Champion by the Triangle Global Health Consortium. Please, a big hand for Pap. Pap has played a big role in global health. He's been an untiring advocate for frontline health workers and family planning, and we'll talk a little about that. You know, when I grow up, I want to be Pap. So, yeah. I'm glad to be in North Carolina, and uh, when I'm here, I'm reminded of the song, Carolina in my mind. My wife is Carolina, so she's on my mind right now. And today, I want to talk about Africa. Aha. I want to talk about Africa, the frontier continent, the rising continent, as you remember from the economists and the time, the dark continent as well, to some people. The continent many of us don't know, and the continent that some actually say has shithole countries. Remember? Yeah? It's my continent, and more specifically, I want us to look at Sub-Saharan Africa. So we'll reduce the countries. We have 54. We'll reduce because we don't have enough time to go through all the 54. So we'll do 46 countries today. Then the others will discuss another day, OK? Countries like Kenya, where I come from. I come from Kenya. In America, they call it Kenya, OK? I come from Kenya, in Nairobi specifically. Countries like Senegal, where Pap comes from. Countries like South Africa, where Mandela comes from. Did you see what I did there? I put Pap, myself, and Mandela in the same sentence. <laughs> Slide in, you know, like, yeah? Countries like Mozambique, where Cyclone Idai just hit people, and so many died in Mozambique, in Malawi, and Zimbabwe. They are all in Sub-Saharan Africa. And many other countries that are not, they're not shithole countries. Many countries doing great things. Countries where my organization, Arm of Health Africa, where I lead, has been working in 35 countries with the community for the last 62 years. So we understand Africa, we've been there, and we work with partners like IntraHealth. Thank you, IntraHealth, for partnering with us to help the people down there. When I say Africa, sometimes I'll, I'll use it interchangeably. I, I mean Sub-Saharan Africa, but I'll, I'll just say Africa so that I can reduce the time. I see my time is clocking down. But I wouldn't be the first one to generalize Africa anyway, because I had somebody, I think it's a first lady of some country, saying, I'm going to Africa. And then we asked, so where, which airport is he going to land? Is it Africa International Airport? <laughs> <laughs> not, not yet. But I also want us to talk about universal health coverage. Universal health coverage, the goal to give all people access to essential health services of adequate, sufficient quality, not excellent quality, sufficient quality, that guarantees a desired outcome without financial difficulty. I know the distinction between excellence and quality is important for this audience because this is a center of excellence in North Carolina, center of research, and therefore excellence of outcomes might come first. But in practice, sufficiency for some of the countries in the world comes first before excellence. So that's an important point. In this conversation, I also want us to realize that this is a unique year for universal health coverage. This year in September, we have the first UN General Assembly high-level meeting to gain political commitment to make sure countries achieve universal health coverage and no one is left behind. So we'll talk a little about that. So I want to make reference to two points very quickly, two concepts. The first concept I want to make reference to is what we refer to generally in global health as the 15% allocation to health. 15% of a country's national budget should be allocated to the health of that, of that country. And this is what we call the Abuja Declaration, which was done in Nigeria 30 years ago. And 30 years later, Nigeria itself, where the Abuja Declaration was done, has never allocated more than 6%. This is the irony, OK? Then I want to talk about taxes and tax efficiency, because we've got to be real. You know, we talk about what countries need to do, but we also need to be real. Then after those two concepts, I want us to explore what are Africa's choices. So I hope this works. Well, one slide is stuck. 
So if you could give me that next slide. Yes, that one. So let's look at reality. Because I don't think this reality always occurs to us, and this will lead us to our conversation. Sub-Saharan Africa has risen significantly, as you can see. If you look at that, the GDP of Sub-Saharan Africa in 2001 was about $374 billion. By the time we hit 2017, $1.7 trillion. So that was a real rise, isn't it? So the economists and time were not wrong to say Africa is rising. But I also want to look at that. That economy was not the only thing that was rising. Population was also rising at the same time. And Africa's population was 645 million people around that time. And by 2017, one billion. And that's sub-Saharan Africa, not the entire Africa. When you go to the entire Africa, we're talking 1.3 billion when you add. So what does that do then? Let's look at that, per capita income. So what does that do to the wealth of the individual, the wealth of the household? It says that at that point, the per capita income was $580. In the US here, your per capita income is way above $40,000. So put that in perspective, OK? So that's 580. So there was growth. It was rising as well, 1,662. But it's diluted by the significant population growth, OK? So if you look at that, while GDP grew 354% in that period, population grew 60%, diluting the per capita income to about 186%. If the population had been held constant, as economists say, ceteris paribus, all factors held constant, then you can imagine that GDP would also have grown by 354%. So keep that in mind. So this is the concept of Africa's economy. The rise was driven largely by increased stability. Many countries that were fragile, were fighting, stopped. It was also driven, surprise, surprise, by the end of the Cold War. Because now countries were no longer aligned to the, you know, this side or that side. And therefore, there was more look at, number one, capitalism and globalization, which was a competing force before. It was also driven by the fourth industrial revolution, digitalization. There are more mobile phones in Africa than there are toilets. So that digitalization has driven part of this growth. And finally, globalization, which is trade. And that has also brought immense inequalities. We've talked about the rising population, but we also must talk about the rising inequality. Because globalization has then divided the people and has created a small, rich, and a big, poor population. So I want to do, um, this is kind of uh, just a very quick look at the numbers. These numbers you see here are about 46 countries, as I told you. So they mask major inequalities country to country. They mask major inequalities male to female. They mask major inequalities between urban and rural, and also stable communities versus communities on the move. You know, people who are in South Sudan, a million people who are now living in Uganda on, the, on, on their Jumani side, you know, you can imagine where they lie on this average scale. In this construct, Africa also faces many challenges related to governance. Governance, because we are multiple countries, different political systems, and countries don't have political party systems. So elections are individual to individual. So every five years, the president is thinking, what can I do to get more votes? So they build buildings, they build roads. They don't think about the people. They need something to show. So that's a big change. The other thing is conflict and corruption. And finally now, climate change, which was just the subject of the keynote address. So those, these challenges have been put in perspective. But one of the main challenges which I want to focus on as we move towards you know, the argument that I have is actually that Africa's economy is too small. And I don't think we pay attention to that enough. Look at this graph or these uh, illustrations. This is the world prepared by territory based on the gross domestic product. Where is Africa? If countries or economies or geographies were to be remodeled based on the size of the economy, that's how the world will look like. 
Why is our continent, Pap? Yeah? That's where Africa is. It is 2%, 2.7% of the global domestic production. 2.7%. But when you go down, if it was to be remodeled by population, by number of people living in the country or population or continent, Africa has seven, it's significant. 17% of the global population. So how do you take care of 17% of the world's people with 2.7% of the world's production? This is a dilemma. This is a dilemma that we have to think about. And this is compounded by the fact that even if Africa was to grow 5% every year, and never mind that IMF and World Bank have actually reduced the projections for this year from 4.2% to 2.7%. So it's been, not been good for the last two, three years. Even if it was to grow by 5% and the rest of the world was to grow by 3%, it would take 70 years for Africa to contribute 10% of the global economy. <coughs> 70 years. That would take us to 2090. By 2090, the African population will be shy of 4 billion if nothing changes. So it will be 30% of the global economy. So you still be saying that you're actually still looking at 10% of the global economy, looking at 30% of the world's population. And projections show, and I hope they're wrong, that by 2100, which is around the 2090, I've told you, the 70 years it takes, even if Africa was to grow by 5% every year, it will, Africa will be having 80% of the world's poor people. Okay? So, let's then go to this dilemma of tax collection. Because we are told all the time, and the whole agenda, and the agenda that was there in Addis Ababa in 2015, after the Millennium Development Goals and coming to SDG, collect taxes, spend your taxes better, collect taxes, and therefore you will resolve the problem. And we agree, because tax collection is a major issue. Seepage and wastage of taxes is a major issue. Corruption is a major issue. But let's look at if we were to be efficient on tax, would we achieve UHC? That's what I want us to look at, okay? So our narrative is this that I've just presented. So collect more taxes, allocate more taxes to health. So we say allocate 15%, this is our narrative, allocate 15% and collect taxes. So let's do a very quick simulation. Please don't give this slide to any of your, to your economics lecturer because it's actually back of the envelope calculations, okay? But you can give it to your social sciences lecturer. <laughs> they won't bother with the numbers. So, Let's look at Netherlands, let's look at North Carolina, and let's look at Sub-Saharan Africa. And what I want to compare are a few facts. Fact number one is the GDP. Did you know, actually, that Netherlands GDP is half the total African continent GDP? Okay? And if you look at North Carolina, it's actually about 30% of total Africa GDP. North Carolina, 10 million people, right? Or around there? Maybe less, okay? I want us to look at tax collection and what we call tax efficiency. So based on the World Bank and IMF and the Addis Ababa agenda, we say tax efficiency is important. So tax efficiency is how much tax you collect out of your total GDP. So if your GDP is 100, how much of that do you collect as taxes so that you can redistribute and provide social services? Now, on average, if you look at OECD or the European countries generally, they will collect about 38%, $38 out of the every 100 as taxes. And this is combined value added tax, income, all the taxes, but excludes resource-based income, like when you're selling minerals and those things. It is excluded here, okay? So that we can equalize countries. So I just want us to assume that we will stick to 25%. Forget about Netherlands, 39%, okay? North Carolina, I am using the average, if you look at the US, the US actually collects less taxes to GDP, it's about 28%, it's less than OECD. Africa collects 13 or so percent. So tax efficiency in Africa is really, really bad on average. 
But we assume that we have responded to the call. Our politicians are better, and we hope they'll be better. And now we have 25% tax collection, tax efficiency, and therefore we are collecting 25%. So equalize the three countries. So Netherlands at 25% collection of the GDP, 213 billion. North Carolina 125, Sub-Saharan Africa 425. Then let's look at the next assumption that actually the government believe after all the advocacy that PAP and the people have been doing and all of us that 15% of your budget must be allocated to health and finally they agree. Can you imagine future scope? That's the future. That's like we hope it happens in our lifetime that countries allocate 15% of their budget to health. So we assume it happens. And then we look at that. 32 billion collected by Netherlands for health or allocated to health, 19 billion allocated by North Carolina to health, and 64 billion allocated. Now let's divide how that money is used on the population because then the next important number is how much is that per person, per capita, so that then you see whether you can provide health care. Look at that, Netherlands, 1,882. Never mind that the actual number for Netherlands is in excess of $4,000. Because they actually have a higher tax efficiency, as I told you, and they allocate more to health. So th this one, we are trying to equalize them. I'm really struggling here. So 1,800. North Carolina, 1,900. What is Africa? 64. With efficiency of taxes and with 15% allocation. How much health can you provide for $64? Even with tax efficiency. And then you see WHO says at least you need $86 per capita for you to provide basic essential primary health care. Not everything, basic essential primary health care. So even with tax efficiency, we still cannot achieve 86%. So this is the dilemma of the health minister. How do you break, how do you get out of this? How do you get out of this? This is a real issue. So I want to move on to this slide here. That actually, universal health coverage is about social justice. It's not about all people. It's about social justice. It is about thinking about those who are last and bringing them first. That's what it is. It's about redistribution of resources that exist. And it's about equity, not equality. That actually, if you look at this, and we were to map universal health coverage here, this is equality. Everyone gets the same thing. And that's the basis of democracy. That's the basis of equality. But is equality fair? Equality is the reason we have such high disenfranchisement of women. Because we say, well, everyone is equal, so just struggle, get forward. Yet you, you forget the issues that hold back populations. Social norms, disempowerment, land rights. You forget all those issues and say, we are equal, so let's compete. Equality is a concept of capitalism and globalization. It only works where basic needs are covered. Because if you give me a car to race, and then you give someone else a car and we race together, even if our engines are best and my engine is better, if I don't have wheels, I can keep revving, my car will never move. So I want to propose here that equity is the way to go. That actually, the $64 we talked about should be spent on those who need to be lifted fast before you can move on to those who are already standing up and who can actually afford. So as I come to an end, I want to propose, therefore, that African governments, ministers, and finance ministers and health ministers need to reorient their definition of UHC to focus, I talked about population, and I talked about vulnerability, to focus on a pro, a feminist pro-vulnerable UHC specifically feminist pro-vulnerable UHC, that will slow down population growth, build human capital, and harvest the demographic dividend that Africa so badly needs. So UHC 
needs political leadership beyond health to rights so that you can look at equity, not equality. It needs to be focusing on the last first and breaking the barrier to reach the last person, not saying they're unreachable. It needs to focus on legislation and regulation because you cannot serve the people, the poor people, if you don't legislate and regulate because you know what they say? Those who have little in life deserve more in law. It needs the concept of upholding quality, but not excellent quality, adequate, sufficient quality. Because with $64, you cannot offer excellent quality, but you can offer sufficient, adequate quality that makes sure that people get the outcome they desire from the health system. And finally, for Africa's rights to be meaningful, we need deep and sustainable UHC that is driven by equity, feminists, and with a vulnerable UHC approach. Africa cannot afford equality. Africa cannot afford excellence. Africa can afford equity and can afford adequacy and sufficiency of the health system. Thank you for inviting me here. Thank you.